Nearly everyone is interested in scenery. Tastes may differ. Some love the breathtaking view from a mountain peak. Others thrill to the pouring of the waves on a rocky shore. Many prefer the lazy river, meandering through quiet green meadows, or even the evidence of man's handiwork impressed upon the landscape. Whatever the preference, there is often the desire to know the why and the wherefore of the great differences in scenery. And while we can all observe, without guidance we miss much, and it requires real training and an eye of faith to visualize what lies behind the shaping of the Earth's surface. To gain an insight into the character of the landscape is no simple task, yet the aim of this film is exactly that. It is the hope of the filmmaker that whilst the language of geology presented here may seem intricate, the simple joy of observing will be no less diminished. This film primarily concerns the landscape of mountains. Despite their great size and age, their lives span out in much the same way as a living creature's does. They have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And as such, the life of a mountain mimics our own. It is a life that carries the weight of being, an anticipation of sadness that one day things will change. Mountains are born, reaching upwards towards the sunlight. They pass through a youthful age of splendor and expectation. Their summits are crowned with snow, their outlines cast great shadows across the landscape, and they dominate the horizon. Eventually, the weathering of old age carves up mountains, reduces them in stature, and they are deemed less desirable by human eyes. At the very end, they are laid to rest. Mountain chains of the world today follow lines of weakness in the Earth's crust. The apparently solid crust is in reality a vast mosaic of rocky plates that are in constant motion. Each of these plates, around 40 to 60 miles thick, floats on a sea of semi-molten rock and moves at a rate of about half an inch a year. As the plates drift apart towards or alongside one another, they crumple, bend and fold at their edges and release strain energy in the form of an earthquake and produce volcanoes as one plate is pushed below another. All these movements in time form the occurrence of mountain building, or orogenesis. A mountain is formed when colliding plates force up the rock between them, or when plates drift apart, releasing great masses of molten material from beneath the crust. The shift of height may occur at the rate of just a few millimetres a year, but given enough time, a lofty chain of mountains is created, towering thousands of feet into the air. They are decorated with ice caps and glaciers, and their prominence on the landscape is unmistakable. They are beautiful in their immensity, and all the good and evil things that happen in the world are of no consequence to the magnitude of their scale. As soon as they are created, mountains are immediately beset on by natural forces that are always seeking to lower the general level of the landscape. Mountain chains are broken down by the action of sun, rain, frost, gravity, and other factors. And as the very high peaks are worn down, mountain torrents flow more slowly, jagged outlines become smooth, gentler slopes become clothed with vegetation, and the landscape is sculpted to correct the mistaken height. This process of breaking down the land is known as denudation. When rock is exposed to the rays of the sun, its surface layers become hot and tend to expand, with the different minerals that make up the rock expanding at different rates. On the sunward side of a mountainous valley, whole rocks can disintegrate and form a mass of coarse angular fragments. Rainfall on rocks can wash away loose particles or softer rocks. Heavy downpours at the foothills of mountains can cause the soil to erode and create deep gullies where the land has been robbed of its vegetation cover and no longer has the roots of plants to bind together the particles of the soil. Rain can also carry a chemical action. As it passes through the atmosphere, it may absorb carbon dioxide in the air, becoming a weak acid. Acidic rainwater that sinks underground may dissolve certain minerals that over time can form wide crevasses and underground channels, robbing the land of its surface streams. As water slowly turns into ice, 
it expands with a powerful force. When rainwater in a crack in the landscape is frozen, it expands and the crack is widened. In due course, great masses of rock may be split off from the mountainsides, and smaller pieces be flaked away. The jagged outlines of so many mountain ranges is the result primarily of the action of frost. When fragments of rock on high mountains become loosened, the detached blocks naturally fall to lower levels. It is in this way that we get the formation of screes on nearly all mountainsides. Within these screes, large masses of rock may remain piled up into steep angles of rest. The action of gravity can be drastic after earthquakes, as landslides can alter the landscape more rapidly than any other force. Wind removes loose dust and sand from the mountainsides and exposes surfaces of solid rock to the action of other weathering agents. The action of the wind itself is much greater when it is armed with sharp particles of tiny rock. Mountain faces can be eroded on the windward side, or when the wind blows alternately from two directions, rock may be cut and polished so as to have two faces meeting in a sharp edge. On high mountains, the place of rain is taken by snow, and when the warmth of the sun or the atmosphere may be insufficient to melt the snow, it steadily accumulates. It packs closer and closer together, and eventually the weight of fresh snow is enough to force the mass to start moving downhill. It is the beginnings of a river of ice, or glacier. The glacier will naturally follow the line of least resistance towards the sea level, but the ice does not behave like a river of water. It does not swing from side to side, but tends to cut a straight path. The glacier carries on its surface rocks which have fallen from the neighbouring hillsides through the action of frost and gravity. Some of these become embedded in the ice mass and can find themselves slowly moved to the bottom layers of ice. They help the ice to scoop out hollows in the mountainsides and valley beds to scratch the solid rocks over which the ice passes. The glacier acts like a powerful rasp Scratches formed in hard rocks make up huge glacier furrows, and as the glacier moves it carves out the landscape beneath it. Vegetation covering a mountain can help protect the surface from atmospheric weathering and denudation, but the plants themselves play an important part in wearing away the land. Plants rooting deep into rocks can force cracks wide open as their roots grow and swell. Vegetation has a chemical action too, where weak acids given out by the root hairs of plants may be able to dissolve certain rocks. Animals play their part in denudation. Small animals may burrow into the ground and cause the collapse of mountain ridges and riverbanks, whilst larger animals strip the surface of vegetation that can prevent erosion. Man has a direct influence as a geological agent when he excavates great holes, quarries and mines, railway cuttings, roads and paths. But his indirect effect is even greater when he removes natural grassland or forest at the foot of a mountainside and exposes the surface to the natural action of weathering. The combined work of the agents of denudation is to reduce the whole landscape to an almost level surface. As time passes, even the highest mountains are worn down. Jagged outlines become smooth, gentler slopes become clothed with vegetation. Steep-sided young valleys become broader and more mature, until the whole landscape gradually forms a very gentle rolling or almost flat surface. There may be isolated hills or lonely mountains rising above the horizon, but the landscape for the greater part is smooth and level. There are no swift streams, only slow-moving rivers, which meander through broad valleys into shallow seas. And it is here that mountains are laid to rest. Over time, the substance of a mountain is broken down, or dissolved into smaller and smaller pieces. Running water picks up and transports the material downstream, where it meets the open water. Over the course of millions of years, water carries the mountains down to the sea, a teaspoon at a time. In this way, a mountain will live and die.
but it may be reborn. The flat landscape may rise again as the result of renewed plate movement and the rejuvenation of rivers. The material of the old mountain may in time be recycled. But this can take millions of years, and until then, the landscape is quiet, humbled and modest, haunted by absent things. <laughs>